Well, good morning and welcome to Tampa Covenant Church and a special welcome to you if you are joining us for the first time today. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. As we gather in our homes and in our hearts to worship our Lord, let us lift up our praises and hope in the day when our precious Lord gathers all of his people together to worship him for all eternity. Let us lift up our hearts. from 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. From 
night, then came the morning. From night, then came the morning. There was sky in the middle of the water. Heaven meets earth. Brothers and sisters, we confess our sins each week together as a community. And we don't do this to get our weekly forgiveness. We don't do it just to feel better about ourselves. We do it because confessing our sins is that which brings us to the joy that we have in Christ. And David said in other Psalms that his body wasted away actually physically when he didn't confess his sin. And what we find is that that is true in many ways, that if we don't confess our sins, our hearts and our minds waste away. So we do it then in order to remind ourselves how much we need Christ, but how good and pleasant and beautiful and joyful life is in Christ Jesus. So let us this morning lift up our voices together and confess our sins. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. 
and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. But you, O oh Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are penitent according to your promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O oh most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God is our hiding place. His unfailing love surrounds us. And he fills our hearts with joy through Christ Jesus. So let us rest in the peace and forgiveness of our sovereign Lord who continues to guide us of the ways we are to go. And he watches over us that our lives may bring honor and glory to him now and forever. Amen.
brothers and sisters, what is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from all the tyranny of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my heavenly Father. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ by his Holy Spirit also assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Good morning. Good morning to our TCC kiddos. Yes, it is our, I believe it's the second week that we're going over Psalm 34, verses 6 through 7. That gives us seven verses for Psalm 34. So Pastor Mark's going to go first, and then you are going to repeat after me, because at the end of the month, you are all on your own. So here we go. Psalm 34, verses 6 through 7. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Psalm 34, verses 6 through 7. Pastor Mark went a little fast, kind of messed up on the, the emotions, but I'm going to go slow now. So repeat after me. Psalm 34, verses 6 through 7. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord and camps around those who fear him and delivers them. Psalm 34, verses 6 through 7. Yes, we did it. We're almost there. So there in verse 6, it says, this poor man he cried, and the Lord heard him. And so we have a good understanding what it means to be poor. It means to not have all of the resources that you need sometimes to take care of yourself. You don't have money. You have a hard time getting food. And so this poor man cries, the Lord hears him, and he saves him out of all his trouble. Well, in some cases, it could be that the Lord saves the poor through people who have means. So in other words, if you have enough that you can give, the Lord asks you to give to those who are, who are poor. Help them in their needs. But also it could mean that this man was spiritually poor. He did not have a relationship with God and he cried out to God and the Lord saved him because if you do not have a relationship with God, Yes, you could be in a lot of trouble. But the Lord saved him. He did not save himself. The Lord saved him. So we cry out to God and the Lord saves us. You have been saved. And also the Lord gives us means to help those who are materially poor, who don't have a lot of things. He provides for them through us. So remember that you can always cry out to God and he will save you. And the Lord calls you to help others in need. Live out that truth in your everyday life, starting today. Now let's pray. Everyone standing up, come close to Pastor Mark. I miss you. I really do. Put your hands up right here and let's pray. Lord, thank you for our children. Thank you for the blessing that they are to us. Thank you for your word, Lord, that is so powerful. 
And may that power, Lord, make its way into their hearts. May they remember your word. May they hide that word in their hearts that they may not sin against you. And Lord, help them to be obedient to what they are learning. Help them to remember, Lord, it is you who save. And help them to remember, Lord, that you give them opportunities to provide for those in need. May that, Lord, be something that we are obedient to all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Can't wait to see you next week. Bye-bye. A reading of Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule with no understanding, which must be curbed by bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but the steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. The word of the Lord. Well, good morning to our church family. And for those of you who are joining, on, joining us online, we're so happy to have you. Even if you stumbled upon us, don't change the channel. Just keep hanging out. We've been walking through the Psalms for this summer in our Old Testament series. And today we're looking at Psalm 32. In fact, we've entitled the series, The Gospel in the Psalms, A Message of of hope. And so we're looking at Psalm 32 today, and there's a lot in this psalm. It's filled with wisdom. There's exhortations, uh, shouts of thanksgiving, and there's also penitence in this psalm. That means that it involves sin. But it's not a sad psalm. In fact, the thrust of the psalm is one of joy. In fact, joy frames the entire psalm. And so when we think of our lives right now, we can recognize that there are many sources of joy that we can name. However, when we look at Psalm 32, it kind of reminds us of a source of joy that we often overlook in our Christian lives, and that is the joy that flows from forgiveness of sin. We're called to this joy. We're called to live into this joy and to live out this joy. And so for some of us, forgiveness of sin, it may look like relief. But as we walk through Psalm 32 this morning, we see that when David recalls his sin, when he looks back on his sin, he doesn't respond in relief. Rather, David responds by proclaiming the joy that is found in forgiveness. And so we'll take a look at this psalm under, under three headings. We'll take a look at the first one would be a proclamation of joy that is spurred on by confession. And the second thing would be how can we pursue this joy that is found in forgiveness? And then we'll end with an exhortation. So let's look to the Lord in prayer this morning and then let us look to his word. Lord, this is the day that you have made and we, your people, we rejoice. And so we ask that you would give us ears to hear, Lord. Give us eyes to see and a heart to receive this word that you have for us. Anoint my lips to speak the truth of your word to your people. And Lord, may with hands and feet, may we move in obedience, swift obedience, to that which you command of us today. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So this first point here is a proclamation of joy. And we open up and David, he starts with this big proclamation of happiness in the beginning of this psalm. And so we read these first two verses and this is what David writes. Blessed or happy, joyful is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Like David is very thorough in describing this condition of sin. David said it's one of guilt, it's waywardness, it's, it's crookedness, and also it is deception. He's very thorough providing us the contours of this condition that we would call sin. And we look at the shorter catechism, it says that the definition is that sin is want of conformity to God's law or transgression against it. So want of conformity to God's law means a sin of omission, something that we fail to do that God commands us to do. Transgression against God's law is something that we do that God commands us not to do. And so we recognize that God is the great divine lawgiver. He makes the rules. And when we transgress those rules by omission or commission, we stand guilty before a holy God. And so we look in scripture and we see that scripture is yes, it is high handed rebellion against a holy God. Scripture is clear about that. But we also see in scripture the perverse ways in which we think, remember, and desire and react in our ways, knowingly and unknowingly. Think of a child. Got little Susie and Bobby running around in the house and you know, Bobby gets a little upset and he, and he hits Susie, he sins. So mom and dad come to Bobby and they say, Bobby, what got into you? What made you, what made you do that? And what does Bobby do? I mean, Bobby shrugs his shoulders. I don't, he says, I don't know. But in reality, we all know. Because what is sin? Sin really is that natural, deep corruption that lies within our hearts. And that's just not one or two persons in the world. That is every single person in the world has been corrupted by sin. We witness the effects of sin every single day in our modern world. There are scores of laws on the books to restrain the, the cruelty and the evil that man is capable of. And every single day, these laws are broken. And when we hear some of those, these stories of the things that happen in our world, how one human being made in the image of God can inflict such harm and cruelty on another, we shrink back and we are aghast and we cannot believe it because that is the reality of sin. That is how sinful sin truly is. So 19th century minister, J.C. Ryle, he has a good definition for sin and this is what he writes. He says that sin is a vast moral disease which affects the whole human race Every rank, every class, name, nation, people, and tongue. And we know that if a disease is not cured, it will wreak havoc on the body in the form of intolerable pain and suffering and anguish. And without a cure, life gives way to death. And this sin, this disease of sin is what was wreaking havoc on David's body. Right there in verses three and four, David says, my bones were wasting away. I was groaning and I was weak. My strength was zapped as like the summer heat was bearing down on me. He was languishing underneath the weight of his sin. The Lord's hand was heavy on David, but there was, there was a cure. And we read of that cure in verse five. David says, when I acknowledged my sin before God, when he acknowledged his condition before the true and only cure giver, he was forgiven. See, instead of covering up 
his guilt. David confessed it to the Lord and he received forgiveness. And so right away, we see the difference between a repentant sinner and an unrepentant sinner. You see, the repentant sinner, he or she confesses and they experience the never ending joy in the presence of the Lord in that relationship. And the unrepentant sinner, because of silence, they are caused to, to languish in suffering and pain under the weight of their guilt and their shame. And there is no self-help, positive thinking, and mental exercise that can cure a person from the disease of sin. There is only one path, and that is to walk humbly in the way of confession and repentance, because this is where forgiveness is found. When we confess our sin, we expose it. We are no longer covering it up. We give it to God and he covers our sin. I usually read from John Bailey's diary of private prayer a few, four or five times a week. And the 18th day evening prayer is very poignant to my life where John Bailey confesses his sin to God as he writes in that journal. And every time I read that 18th day prayer, it's like I'm looking in the mirror. John Bailey and I are separated by centuries plus. He's a white man, he's a Scottish man, but we both suffer from the same condition and it's called sin. And this is what Daly, Bailey writes. He asks God to, to have mercy upon him for his deceitful heart and crooked thoughts, for harsh words spoken deliberately, for thoughtless words spoken hastily, for envious and prying eyes, for ears that rejoice in what is wrong, that do not rejoice with the truth, for greedy hands and for feet that have been lazy, that have gone into the wrong places, for proud and disdainful looks. And John Bailey continues, and this is what he writes as well. He says, in asking for your forgiveness, I cannot claim a right to be forgiven, but I can only cast myself on your boundless love. And when we cast ourselves on the boundless love of God, he hears us and he answers us and God forgives our sin. If there, if there is any prayers that we can be most confident of in this Christian life is when we ask the Lord to forgive us of our sin, he removes it. He covers our guilt. And so now that David has proclaimed the joy of forgiveness, David, he can't keep quiet. And so now he exhorts the godly, the godly people, the godly among him, he exhorts them to prayer. And so that brings us to this second point on how we are to pursue this joy that is found in forgiveness. We do it by placing a high priority on prayer. This is what David says in verses six and seven. He says, therefore, now if he says, therefore, we go back and we see what it's there for. David says, well, therefore, in, in light of God's mercy, that's why, in light of God's mercy, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. And so what do these verses, verses six and seven, what do they teach us? They teach us that we must, in our walk with the Lord, place a high priority on prayer because we know that prayer is important. God, he commands us to pray. Jesus taught us how to pray. He taught us how to approach God as father. Jesus is our great mediator and high priest, and it is him who we utterly depend on to communicate to God through us. And what about the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit intercedes for us. And so knowing this, Knowing this, can you say that prayer is a priority in your life? 
And if you are struggling to answer that question, there's something that we can do about it this morning. It's, it's a quick, practical step. It's called realigning your priorities in your relationship with the Lord. This is what I mean. The time management gurus, they tell us this. They say like, when we are managing our lives, we're called to identify the highest priorities. And these high priorities, these are the biggest rocks in our lives. And these are the things that we are called to focus on first. So then if we start your day and you concentrate on those lesser things, then it follows that you won't have enough time in the day to do that which is more important. And we can apply that same principle in the home and we can apply that principle in the workplace. So we'll apply it to the workplace. And so you, you walk into work and the minute you walk into work, you're inundated by, by phone calls, by messages, and you visit just a little bit around the office or you visit with, with friends or you surf the net. And then you're taking a look at your phone and you're going through your apps and you're, you're going through all of your social media apps. And by the end of the day, since you've concentrated on the lesser things, the insignificant things, by the end of the day, what have you accomplished? Yes, you have not accomplished very much because you have neglected those things that are of the highest priority. And if you did get to those things, it's probably a rush job. And if it was a rush job, you probably produced a poor product. And all it reflects is a neglect of one's highest priorities and poor time management. Okay, so now we can take this practical paradigm and we can add a spiritual component to it. And so spiritually speaking, what is to be our highest priorities as Christians? It's our relationship with God. He is the biggest rock. All else is nothing but pebbles and sand. Therefore, he comes first. And so we make it an absolute priority to commune with God regularly in prayer. It's a high priority, probably the highest priority. And this is exactly what David was exhorting us to in verse 6. David was saying, do not wait until sin overtakes you to pray. David says that regular communing with God in prayer is what keeps the rushing waters of sin from drowning you, from overtaking you. And so here's, here's what I mean. Our daily offering to God in prayer must not only consist of adoration, thanksgiving, or also supplication. Gimme, gimme, gimme. There also, and there must be a component of confession in our regular prayer with God as we commune with him. It's called preventative maintenance. If you operate any type of machinery, we all know that if preventative maintenance is not kept up, you are going to run into problems. And the exact same thing happens in our relationship with the Lord. If we are not communing regularly with the Lord in prayer, we will run into problems. If there's no adoration, if there's no confession, no thanksgiving, and no supplication made on behalf of others daily in our prayers to the Lord, it just simply follows what kind of relationship do we have with God as his, his children. So let us, let us make it a priority this morning to regularly commune with God in prayer. When we reflect on his mercy toward us, let it drive us to our knees to him in prayer. And the result is daily deliverance from the ruling and enslaving power of sin. And that is why David could confidently, confidently, refer back to the Lord as his refuge, his hiding place, his preserver and his deliverer. That is where the joy is found. And so now we look at, we look at verse eight and the Lord responds to this prayer 
with an exhortation to the godly. He promises to instruct them, to teach them in the way that they should go, and to counsel them with his watchful eye. And this brings us to this third point, this, this exhortation, this powerful exhortation. And it's to live with godly wisdom. When we look at the wisdom writings throughout scripture, we know that there are, there are only two ways to live. You can walk in the way of the righteous or you can walk in the way of the wicked. There is no middle road. And so when we heed God's teaching, when we heed God's counsel and, and his instruction, we are actually walking in the way of the righteous. But when we do it our way, that is when we run into problems. And that is when the warning has, has to take place for the godly who forsake the way of wisdom. So we look here in verse nine, and, and this is what the Lord says. The Lord says, don't be like the horse or don't be like the mule because these animals, they have to be controlled by bit and bridle. You see, horses and mules, they do not possess wisdom. If you don't corral a horse, it will absolutely run. And mules are so stubborn, they only move when they want to move. Remember what we saw last week in Psalm 111, right there at the end of the Psalm. The Psalmist writes, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And all those who practice it, they have a good understanding. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice this wisdom, they have a good understanding. And so practicing wisdom in this Psalm, it means not remaining silent concerning the sin in our lives, but confessing it to the Lord in prayer. Not to do so is to be subject to the Lord's discipline. No exceptions. Remember what David described to us when he was talking about the Lord's discipline upon his life. He said that the Lord's hand was heavy, caused his bones to waste away and to groan, and it, it made him weak. But this wasn't, this wasn't a malicious act by the hand of the Lord. Rather, this was an act of love. We look back in Proverbs 3, and the Proverbs writer says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline, for the Lord reproves him whom he loves, as a father the son in whom he delights. As a boy, I always mistook discipline for punishment. And my dad would probably quote a variation of this scripture, and I just really did not understand it at that time. You see, punishment is punitive. The offender has to repay the debt that they have been, that they have incurred. And the offended is the one who benefits from that debt. That debt has to be repaid in some way, form, or fashion. Discipline is corrective. Discipline is used to change negative behavior. And the offender, the offender, and by the way of discipline, they are the one who benefits from discipline. And the lessons that we learn from discipline, they grant us a perspective on how to behave in the future. You see, the wicked are not granted this same opportunity of discipline apart from the grace of God. Remember when we opened up to Psalm 1 a few weeks ago, the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked, it comes to ruin. It perishes. It comes to nothing. Verse 10 in our, in our text today, the Lord says, many are the sorrows of the wicked, meaning many anguish, many sufferings, and, and many pangs of pain. Day in and day out, the wicked live with this disease of sin that is just eating away at their bodies. That is called being under judgment and punishment awaits. But those who trust behave antithetically to the wicked. Those who trust in the steadfast love of the Lord, they are surrounded by that steadfast love and the Lord pursues them violently. The Lord disciplines them 
and the Lord will not let up because he recognizes that we are his people and he is our God. That is a relationship. And so that's what we're called to do. We are called to live out this joy of forgiveness in our everyday lives. And so I just want to leave us with, with one consideration before we depart today. And the consideration is this. If we want to live into the joy of forgiveness, then we have to recognize the danger of deceitfulness. Remember our New Testament meditation passage that came from 1 John there in the first chapter where John exhorts these Christians to, to walk in the light. As Christ is in the light, walk in the light. The Old Testament equivalent for that may be stay on the path as we see in the wisdom writings. And everything that John writes is applicable to today's message. But I want to call your attention to two verses that we already went through today. First verse is, is this, in verse 8, John says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And then he says it another way in verse 10. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And we can't walk away from, from these verses saying that, okay, I'm not that bad. It's okay. I'm just a little bit off. I slip up every now and again. No, we walk away from these verses and from today's text recognizing that yes, we are capable of sinning, we have sinned, and we will continue to sin in this life. In other words, we are sinners and we have a sin problem. We cannot deceive ourselves and in any way, shape, form, or fashion, make light of our sin. We need a savior because we can't save ourselves. Remember what David exclaimed back there in our text. David exclaimed that the joy of forgiveness is found in a man whose spirit there is no deceit. You see, because when we practice deceit, we misrepresent the truth to others and we misrepresent the truth to ourselves. And that's nothing more than self-deception. It's lying to others and that we lie to ourselves. And there are many ways in which we practice deception, self-deception. We minimize our sin. We make excuses. And if our lives are characterized by minimizing our sin, it basically means that we are just living a big, fat lie. One, another way that we minimize our sin is that we appeal to God's knowledge of our hearts. Oh, God knows my heart. God knows my heart. So therefore, I'm good. Or we blame shift or we project. Oh, I was under stress. There was a lot of pressure. And so therefore, because of the stressful conditions, because of the, the pressure, it's not my fault. Or we just flat out ignore sin. And we walk around as if nothing ever happened. There is nothing to repent from. There is nothing to confess. And we just blot it out. Meanwhile, our consciences are just eating us from the inside out, but we've shut off that warning light and we blot it out. Paul tells the church in Galatia to do not be deceived, that God is not mocked, and whatever we sow, that we will also reap. And so the question is, what is the solution for this problem of deceit? What's the solution? Two quick things. The first thing is we have got to realize and understand and know who we are. The fact is that we are justified. That's one. And the second thing is we have to know how we should then live in light of who we are. 
It's just who we are, and this is how we live it out. And so how do we do that? Well, the first thing, recall that we looked at the Heidelberg Catechism, question number one. And this is what we confessed this morning. We confessed that <clears throat> the question was, what is our only comfort in life and in death? And this is what we confess, that we are not our own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and death, to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who fully paid for all of our sins with his precious blood. And we can stop right there because how comforting it is to know that Jesus Christ has fully paid for all of our sins, past, present, and future, with his precious blood. The bankruptcy that we experience because of our sin has been wiped off the books. We are no longer under judgment, liable to punishment. We have been justified. The slate has been wiped clean. Our debt has been fully paid through Christ. God has made a way possible for us not only to be forgiven positionally in him, but every day as we live our lives, he has made a way possible for us to experience the joy of his forgiveness, all because of who we are in Christ. So that's number one, recognizing and understanding and knowing who we are. Second thing is, how shall we then live in light of who we are? And that's where the second question of the catechism comes in, which we don't say when we're together, but I would recommend uh, you looking that up. And the second question, it says this, it asks us, what do we need to know in order to live and die in the joy of this comfort? And here's the first thing, how great my sin and misery are. How great my sin and misery are. The second thing is this, how I'm delivered from all my sins and misery. And the third is this, how I am to be thankful for such deliverance. It, those three things simply speak of guilt that we were under, the grace that we have received, and the gratitude that we are to express in our lives because of what was done for us in the person and work of Christ. And so what do we take away from from this catechism? What do we take away from Heidelberg 1 and, and Heidelberg 2? What do we take away? It's what David realized in Psalm 32 in our text today, that when we truly, when we truly understand the greatness of our sin and we confess it to God for the sake of Christ, we experience absolute joy of forgiveness. And we, we join with the psalmist we join with the psalmist with glad shouts, with rejoicing. And that is how we live out our lives. Why? Because our God is, is just. He's gracious. And our God is merciful. And our God, he covers our sin for the sake of his son. And live out that good news in your life now until the day of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's appearing. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the, the good news of, of your son, the good news of our redemption. We thank, Lord, of the many joys that we experience in this life, but we thank you for the joy that we experience because of your mercy. Help us, Lord, not to live deceitful lives, but help us, Lord, to live into the grace that you have so freely provided to us through your son, Christ. May he receive praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name, amen.
Jeremiah declares that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Brothers and sisters in Christ, please bow your heads with me as we bring our petitions to God. Father, we praise you and thank you for the beauty of your creation. We thank you for your warm sun and for your refreshing rains. Grant us grace to be good stewards and to use wisdom as we care for your world. Forgive us for forgetting to join in the, with the heavens as they declare your glory and the skies as they proclaim the good work of your hands. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Father, we praise you and thank you for your word. We thank you that you are not a God who is silent, but instead, through the power of your spirit and through the work of your servants, you have given us holy scripture for our instruction, our edification, our enjoyment, and our hope. Forgive us for misusing your word, for treating it lightly, and for leaving it unread. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, Father, we praise you and thank you for one another. We thank you that you have given us the privilege not only to be recipients of the gospel, but to demonstrate that same gospel through our witness and through our acts of compassion. Lord, forgive us for our self-centeredness and forgive us for our silence. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy on me, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy on me. Here are prayers for all who are needy. Bind up those who are injured, heal those who are sick, and strengthen those whose faith is waning. We pray for the helpless. We pray for those who are in danger. We pray for those who bear sorrows and pain and hatred inflicted by others. We pray for our public servants and our first responders. Be with the unemployed and with businesses that have suffered loss. We pray for medical personnel and care teams and chaplains and be with those who lead us. May they do so with wisdom. May they do so with humility. May you be their hiding place. And may the good news of your son's redemption open eyes and renew minds and soften hearts this day and always. So those of Tampa Covenant Church and others who have visited with us this day Please join with me as we recite the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today and hope to see you next week. And before we depart, just want to provide you with a few announcements and of course some encouragements. We ask that you would continue to communicate, connect and care with, with one another. And there are opportunities for prayer requests. If you have a prayer request, please send those in through the website and we will give you a call and pray with you. There's a Zoom prayer meeting that meets every Sunday at 9.15 on Zoom. The information, the link will be on the website. Please tune into that, 30 minutes or so, and then you can join us on the website on YouTube for the service. Also on the website, there's information on our ladies Bible study. They're studying the book of Hebrews and they're doing very, very well and enjoying fellowship with one another as they learn God's word and 
also home groups. Our home groups are listed on the website as well. So please check that out and join a home group this week. Midweek Minute. Our Midweek Minute is every Wednesday at 8 a.m. Don't forget to tune in to that. And church family, thank you for your sacrificial giving to the, your church at this time. Thank you for supporting the ministries and the mission of this church. And we pray that God will sustain you as he has sustained us through your tithes and your offerings. And so if you would please raise your hand and receive this blessing and this benediction. Just remember, as we go out, live lives without deceit. Rather, live into the joy of forgiveness that only comes by the grace of God. And we know that this grace of God is greater than all of our sin. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. And as we go, let us recite the mystery of our faith that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. So go in peace to love and to serve God. Amen. Hallelujah, rising like the daylight. Heaven needs her.